We're going to worship together.
much for the truth that we can stand on today, that no matter what, your joy is our strength. In our weakness, you are so much more, God. So today we just lift up your name, God. We elevate you. We're so grateful for you, Jesus. As we stand here and remember you, as we remember what you've done, who you are, Lord, we know that we can never say thank you enough.
powerful moment it is for us as believers to gather in this place and just lift up a shout of praise to our God, to tell him how grateful we are for him, his character, his heart, just who he is. And I love the scripture in the Bible that tells us to give thanks in every season, in every circumstance, for that is his will in our life. And I know that's hard. I know that doesn't always look the same. But as I'm reading that scripture and I'm singing these songs, I'm reminded we're kind of in the only time of the year in Texas where it's nice outside. <laughs> we can actually eat dinner outside, the kids can play, it's so lovely. But you know what's coming is 115 degrees. And it's miserable, we know that. But I think about the character of our God and when we see dead grass, horrible temperatures, he sees something that he can grow in. And even in those crazy temperatures, even when it's freezing, stuff can still grow. But it has to be tended to. And the songs we're singing this weekend are just such good reminders of the fruits of the Spirit that God wants to cultivate in our lives. That he's told us, live by these fruits of the Spirit. And I think back to the scripture, give thanks in every season. It's so easy to give thanks when it's 72 and sunny, all your relationships are great, everything in life is going your way, but it's a lot harder to give thanks in seasons of brown, death, darkness. But God can still use those seasons to produce good fruit. But sometimes the problem is that we allow the weeds of sin in our life to choke that out but the thing about God is he's so faithful if we ask him to come alongside of us, to prune those things out of our life, to tend to what he has for us. He's so faithful to walk through and walk with us until we see that good fruit. And so today as we continue to worship, as we thank the Lord that he's our joy, that we can be grateful no matter what, that he is so, so good to us. I just wanna encourage you Ask him to show you the areas in your life where those weeds of sin may be choking out the good fruit that he has for us. So we're gonna continue to worship. We're gonna proclaim together that God is so, so good. But let's use this moment to really check in with the Lord and see if he has something better for us, something deeper for us.
sing that again. All my life. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. Well, whoops, I can't see you anymore. <laughs> Welcome to the Creek, guys. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we just want to say welcome. If this is your first time, we want to say thank you. Thank you for joining us on campus as we lift up our Savior. If this is your first time or you're just looking for a good way to get connected or to let us know if you need prayer, the way to do that is the connect card and the seat back in front of you or on the screen. But if this is your first time, we would love to have you stop by the Welcome Center. We really want to connect with you. Love on you. Well, as we go into April, we do have several ways for you and your family to be connected to the heart of the creek. So let's turn our attention to the screen. Let's check those out together. We love you guys. Thank you for being here. Hey, everyone. My name is Steven, and I'm excited to share with you about our marriage conference coming up on April 25th and 26th at our Fort Worth campus. This two-day event will help strengthen your relationship, provide tools to fight common marital issues, and allow you to enjoy quality time with your spouse. Regardless of whether you're newly engaged or have been married for years, sign up on the website or church center and join us. We've been married for 40 years and we were old high school sweethearts. We have been married, uh, in May will be three years. Um, we are a blended family um, with one son who's nine years old. Go ahead, my love. Uh, we've been married <laughs> almost five years, five years in June. We, uh, we've actually been married 49 years as of Easter Sunday. Uh, we met when we were uh, 14, 15 years of age. We actually got married when we were 16, 17. Oh. We're very opposite. <laughs> very much so. Um, Travis is more outgoing and loud and energetic, and I'm definitely more introverted and quiet. He is a lot more spontaneous. I need a, about six weeks if you want me to be spontaneous. That's true. notice about six weeks ahead. Like, I thought I knew who I was before I got married, and I'm now I'm like, I don't even know who that person was. So it's surprising seeing how much you've grown. You know, we don't have to continually talk. We can be in the same room for three hours and not say a word. And we love each other, but we actually like each yeah. other. Uh, first year of marriage, I, probably when we said I do, I don't think we had any idea what I do meant, to be honest with you. Every single thing that you do not only impacts your family, but impacts your spouse. And yeah. Can completely change their day. Yeah. It's, and there, yeah. there's no hiding. Like yeah, anything, yeah. like you can't hide in your marriage. Yeah. Anything that's like, in secret. I mean, it's biblical, yeah. right? It's yeah. going to come into the light. Yeah. I think it's really just learning each other's love language. Um, because like, for me, I'm definitely more of like words of affirmation. And um, I like to do acts of service. And though my acts of service that I do for her each morning, I feel like I'm doing well, it might not speak to her in that same way. So um, her, her love language is definitely quality time and spending that time. And I'm more of the kind that always on the go, ready to go, let's do the next thing. Um, and then really learning to slow down and learn how, what it's like to put your partner first. I actually think fighting well means that at the end of the day, really you don't wanna, you don't wanna come out victorious, you don't wanna win her, because by default you would have a loser. Just being able to recognize what, what's important and what's not important to stew on or that I know his heart, mm -hmm. and so we give each other a lot of grace. When somebody you love tells you something that you need to change, listen once and then listen again. Because especially as men, if you take that wisdom and you apply it, you become a better husband, you become a better dad. I think we've made really good progress, especially here lately, on learning how to communicate better with each other, um, learning to fight the issue and not each other. You know, communication is always important. 
But what are you communicating? Are, are you a, you know, do you have a critical spirit, a judgmental spirit? Are you unforgiving? Are you uh, rude or disrespectful? That's communicating. But are you communicating the right things, the fruit of the spirit? That listening is probably one of my biggest listening and uh, not allowing my emotions to get a hold of me. Um, remembering, you know, that um, God's got this. Like we have a saying in our family, are we in peace? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a way for us to just know, you know, like with all the sarcasm, with all of the like, you know, side eyes, with all of the whatever going on, like, are we in peace? Like at the root of it, are we in peace with each other? But my son-in-law was preaching a message one time and he said, he said, make a list of all the things that you would like in a spouse. And he said, and then be that list. If you're gonna make a list, try to live up to that list yourself. How are we doing? Hey, I just want to thank all of our couples that shared in that for being vulnerable and pouring wisdom into us. It's amazing that when we think we've got it all figured out, something new comes along, right? Uh, so I'm glad you're here. Um, uh, this is not a normal weekend, and I'm just going to say that because uh, so much is happening in the life of the church this weekend. Uh, we are having our grand opening for our Azel campus on Sunday, and so it's exciting. Um, I just want to say to the core team, thank you so much for everything that you have poured in over the last months. Uh, we have seen our core team more than double since November, uh, and the time and investment and prayer and everything in Fort Worth campus, thank you for, for standing with us as family to help send, and uh, it's just an amazing thing. I'm looking forward to that, uh, and so it's, it, it's, it's not a normal weekend because of that, but also because um, I want to be an Azel tomorrow for the grand opening. So what's happening is we are doing all of our Sunday services will be video. So tonight is being recorded. And so everybody who comes to the Fort Worth campus, you'll have me on video. Sorry, they'll put me in a screen, you know, uh, but you can't keep baby in the corner long. Uh, the reason we're doing that, and let me just say it's Fort Worth. So I'm, I'm talking to Saturday, but let me say this to Sunday. You know, I'm speaking into the future. You should have come on Saturday. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Nobody walk out or anything. And stop that guy back there, please. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, so on. Uh, uh, I really did lose my train of thought. Heather, what was I saying? Video on Sunday. I'm speaking on Sunday. I'm speaking in the future. See, I got so far into the future, I already forgot what I said in the past. So it's just right now. Uh, but on, uh, on, on Sunday, all of our campuses are going to experience the same thing together. So we'll have video at Azel, and, and we'll have video here in Fort Worth, but that's not going to be the norm, Fort Worth. Don't worry. Please don't get all up in arms. You know, it, we'll be back to live teaching next week. And Azel, we have a special teaching for you next week. That one will be live. And uh, so it's just, it's just it's fun to do things different in the life of the church. I think if a church, if we get in a rut, uh, that starts to really... Uh, just get mundane and boring, and eventually one end of that rut will fall in, and it turns into a grave, and so that's not where I want to do ministry, and I just want to thank you for that. We're in a series called Marriage Mosaic, and uh, uh, just a couple things coming up at the end of this month. Uh, April 25th and 26th, we have a marriage conference, and I just encourage you to sign up for that. Space is limited, but you can still you can still get in. If your marriage is in a great spot, it's it's just maintenance. If your marriage is in a mess, it's collision repair. So whatever you need for that conference, uh, God's going to bring what He needs to your marriage. And then you don't want to miss the last weekend. It's the April 27, 28 weekend, because Heather and I both are going to be on the platform, and I, I might get paid back for all the stories and everything I've said. Uh, but remember, you owe me money if you talk about me that way. Um, but uh, 
we're going to teach together. And what we've, we've, we've done is in our life groups, there's been some questions coming in. So we're going to talk about, about marriage, our marriage. Uh, we're going to talk about just principles of marriage, um, intimacy, family. I'm going to let, let Heather talk about all the intimacy stuff. But uh, um, family, money, you know, dealing with all that. So it's gonna, it'll be a, it will be an interesting weekend. We'll just say it that way. It's going to be good, though. I'm excited. Uh, last week, what we started out the, conf- uh, the uh, conference, not the uh, what this is, message series uh, with was unity. So we were going through Ephesians chapter 4, and the first command in that was, was to be united to each other. And so unity in our marriage, it's committing to one another's holiness, that I had to establish that, that Heather is my wife, but she is also the church. And my responsibility as a Christ follower and part of the church is to build her up in holiness and build her up in the unity that we have. This week, we're going to talk about how do we put things together from the broken. Uh, Conflict and reconciliation, because every marriage has brokenness and conflict. Every relationship has it, to be honest. I mean, just be be real, because people are broken, people messy. And the key is how we address that. So if you got your Bibles, go to Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, we're going to kind of build on where we were last. Last week, but uh, if you'll remember, if you were here last week or if you weren't, let me let me just say this about this this book called Ephesians. It's originally a letter that a man named Paul wrote that Jesus radically changed his life. He's writing a letter to a church in a town called Ephesus to encourage them and to teach them and then give some give some give some instruction because the first three chapters of this letter or book are our doctrine. So they're a foundation for who God is, the grace of God, what he's done for us, the things that we could not do on our own, where grace makes us alive and, and brings us into this relationship with him. And then the last three chapters are our responsibility or how we walk this out. And uh, it really comes into, when I think about this in the context of marriage, because, you know, when we read the Bible, we want to we wanna study it in a particular way. We want to we immerse ourselves in the context of what's going on. And so we start asking ourselves, what was going on in that context? What were the original hearers hearing, and what was it speaking into their context? And then we get to that understanding before we start going, well, here's what I, I want to apply it to my life. But eventually, we need to get across that bridge of applying the Word of God to our life. I mean, my, I, I, I am a, I'm a husband and a father before anything else. I mean, really, I'm a son. I'm a child of God before anything else. But my primary duty, my primary job is, is as a husband, then as a father, then as a pastor. And, and when I read scripture, the, you know, I see what Paul's talking about and how to live out this life that, that, that I have to realize it's core centric. Everything starts inside of me to work out. And grace is that way. Grace comes in, changes me inside, and that moves out. Um, everything that God is cultivating that Abby was talking about earlier, that's cultivated inside, and that begins to make an outward expression. So if, if I have to realize this, if I'm going to have a godly, life-giving marriage, it always starts with me. And, and so often it's easy to point the finger and say, well, if she would, if she would do this differently, or if she would do this more, or if she would never do that, you know, it, it, and so it's easy, but I have to realize that God has called me, and I have to, I have to focus here first. And, and so when we start getting into this next section of Ephesians, Paul is again writing this to the church. These are people who have professed a faith in Jesus who is crucified and resurrected, and and he's going to challenge them to walk in this new life. And uh, so he starts out in verse 17. He says, now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So what he's saying, when he says Gentiles, um, that, that just, it's a reference to, to unsaved. So people who have not yet encountered the grace of God. And he's saying, you know, you thought one way, here's what your life was, and then Jesus transforms everything, and this is what your life is now. Don't, don't think that way. Don't respond that way. Don't get into that. And, and when he talks about this idea later about repentance, it's really repentance is a change of our mind. 
That, that before God changes my heart, I have to set my mind on that. I have to become aware of my condition and a hard heart, and it will darken our thinking. And, and ultimately, that's where the devil gets in there because Satan loves to work in the darkness. And what he loves to do is to blind us of God's truth and to continue leading us into ignorance. And, and a hard and calloused heart will, will lead us further into sin. And what Paul says here is alienation from God. It's a separation from God. He's given a challenge to people who have made a commitment to follow Jesus. And he goes, don't revert back to this. You used to think this way. You used to react this way. You used to live this way. But there's something different that, that is going on. And if you want to see how all that plays out in more detail, you can read uh, the letter of Romans, Romans chapter 1, and that'll give us some insight. But he's talking about this heart. And Solomon said this in, um, in, in Proverbs chapter 4. He said, guard your heart. With everything, keep it with all vigilance because it's the wellspring of life. It's the spring of life. And so from our heart it is, is what is, it is producing everything. And he's saying the hardness of heart is producing these things in the life of someone who is alienating from God. And, and so when you think about our heart, our heart produces our thoughts. And then our thoughts produce our actions. And then ultimately actions develop a character. And so he's telling us, don't walk this way, don't think this way. But he goes into a transition here in the next verse, in verse 20. He says, but that is not the way that you heard about him and you were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. He said, so don't think this way, and it's kind of like, so instead of focusing on what not to do, let me, let me show you the right way, because he says, again, he's speaking to the church. He goes, but that's not how you learned Jesus. And when he says you learned Jesus, he's not saying you learned about Jesus. To, to learn in this context, and when you break down the grammar, he said it's a process of learning. It's, it's continual knowing Jesus, that you know him and you continue to know him. There's a lot of people who, who know about Jesus or, or think they know a lot about Jesus, but, but, but do you truly know him? I mean, I can know a lot about Sir Winston Churchill. I can, I can get books. I can download things. I can watch documentaries. But here's the thing. All I will ever do is know about him. I will never know him because he's dead. But Jesus is alive at the right hand of the Father, and we can know him. We can have a relationship with him. It's like when Heather and I were dating, and then we got engaged and got married. Finding out new stuff is always fun, Right? I mean, when you find out her favorite color is green, oh, yeah, I like green, too. You know, my favorite restaurant is, oh, I like that, too. And, you know, you're just finding all this common ground. You're learning things about each other. But eventually that stops, and what we get the opportunity to do is to know each other. I mean, because we, we've got a lot of life under our belt, and our favorite restaurant when we were dating is not our favorite restaurant now, simply because our favorite restaurant when we were dating, it's what we could afford, you know, and we couldn't even afford to order off the menu. We would go in and order chips and salsa with a side of ranch and get water with lemon. That was two twenty-five, and I threw a five down. I mean, we—that was the high rolling, baby. But it's like I'm gonna take you to your favorite restaurant. If I pull in the parking lot, she'd be like, "Where are we going?" But I, I learned stuff about her. But now I know her. And that's what Paul's saying here about Jesus. He said, look, you just don't make a decision and ask God for the grace to forgive us and give us new life and not do anything to continue to know Jesus. Our Bible study and time in the word and time together, it's not to know about Jesus. It is to know him and to experience him. He goes, that's how you were taught. That's what I'm calling you to. He said, you believed the truth and now you have new life in Christ and we can now live in his likeness. So what he's saying is this, you have a renewed mind in Christ. You don't think with a, with a futility of thought. You have a changed heart. It has, been, it has been transformed that God has taken the heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh that is soft and malleable. You have a change of desire. The things that we used to do, we no longer have a desire to do. And he says you have a different way of thinking and acting, and ultimately you have a different character to reflect. He says it's this new self and this new identity. You know, it's kind of an illustration I give in a wedding. 
Um, and, and I give it a little bit, too, when we do baptism weekends. I love baptism weekends. And I love doing weddings because you got two people that are just like, they look so scared. And I, there's times I'm like, and you should be. <laughs> but I, I make this comment when I hold the rings. And if you've ever been to a wedding I do, if you ever go to a wedding I do, you're probably going to hear this because it's funny and it always gets a laugh in the ceremony. So it will stay in the ceremony. So I take the rings and I hold them up. It's like, whoa, that's a lot of bling. And like, ah. Yeah. And then so everybody laughs. But then I bring it down. I'm like, now I got your attention. Listen to me. I say, this ring is a symbol of this covenant that you're making today. The ring is not the covenant. It's a symbol. Just like your baptism. The baptism didn't save you. The baptism is a symbol of a new life. That when you get baptized and you're placed under the water, we say you're buried with Christ in death and then raised to walk in new life. And I tell them that this ring, when it goes on your finger, and and, and here's what I tell them to say, to repeat to each other. I give you this ring. And with all that I am and all that I have, I honor you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's merely a symbol that my old life is gone. My single nature is gone. I have now died, and that has been buried. That's an old man, and I am now a husband, which is a new identity. And so what Paul is saying is like, look, as a Christ follower, you're dead to sin. You're dead to the futility of thinking. You're dead to the hardness of heart. You are dead to all that old life because you in Christ have been crucified with Christ and you have been raised. That's what Paul teaches us in the early chapters of Ephesians, that you, you have been made alive in Christ. You are a new creation. And, and so we move into that and he says, that's how we operate and so the couple gets married, and they walk down the aisle, and it's a celebration at the reception, and the honeymoon phase is great. I mean, in the honeymoon phase, you don't smell breath. You know, you don't care about an unmade bed. You don't care who's using which towel. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just incredible. But then life hits, right? And then you got to start having some real-life conversations, and that can cause, that can cause some conflict, you know, and so what, what I want to do is kind of give us some things that Paul is teaching us in this passage about dealing with the conflict. You know, he's talking about, he'll talk about dealing with it in the church, but remember, my wife is the church. Ladies, your husband is the church. Your wife is the church. You are the church. You have a responsibility to build them up. And even in conflict, I mean, there's conflict in the church. I mean, church is people, right? You're, anywhere you have people, you're going to have conflict. But I, what I've realized is before I can address external conflict, I have to first address it internally. Like I have to understand that internal brokenness will create and perpetuate external brokenness. So that just as grace has to start inside and work its way out, peace has to start inside and work its way out. If I don't have internal peace and I'm not operating from that platform, then it's hard for me to have any peace in my relationships externally. And when something is broken, listen, we have to address it. We can't just dance around and hope it'll get better. We have to address it. But, the, you know, I, I shared last week a little bit of my fighting strategy, right? Um, let me give you some more of the tactics of that. So early on in Heather and I's marriage, when we would come to a point of conflict, we had to learn our fighting style. That wasn't easy. But we learned our fighting style, and so I'm the type of person where she, she can bring that to me, and I have to step back. I have to step back. I have to process it. And I have, to, that I have to go into my own process. And the, the first part of my process is prayer. Well, let me be honest with you. <laughs> the first part of my process most of the time is not prayer. Don't, th- don't judge me. The first part of my process is getting over my feelings. Because what she said may have angered me. And so I got to deal with, I have to deal with, am I angry or am I, am I hurt? Am I frustrated, what it is, but I have to get it to this point. I have to get it to prayer. And I have to say, it's praying a David prayer when he says, search my heart, O God, and reveal any way in me, because let's address it so that you can lead me in the way everlasting. And so when I ask God to search my heart, that's where, that's where it has to get real, and God's grace can move in that. And I have to ask myself some questions. Is this my selfishness? Is this, is this, is my, do I have sin that's causing this? Do I have an attitude that's causing this? Do I have brokenness that I'm projecting on them and on her that, that, that is causing this? You know, if my marriage is all about her holiness, am I operating in holiness? 
And I eventually have to get to the question of, is my, am I operating from a renewed heart and a renewed mind, and am I reconciled with God? And I have to start at that internally because I'm checking that. So before I can go into addressing the conflict, I've got to deal with some things inside. Otherwise, I start fighting out of my emotions. I start fighting out of my brokenness. And, and, and here's what I've learned about myself is that, that if I don't let things go, I can be having an argument today that was something from five years ago. So I have to let God work inside of me first. That internal reconciliation with God is the foundation for reconciliation with other people, especially in our marriage. So I have the internal address, and that's where God can let me act out of grace and to be able to handle conflict in a way like Jesus handles it. I mean, Jesus, if you think about it, Jesus was beautiful at handling conflict. He endured conflict. He, he caused it. He ended it some, but he always did some things. He always spoke truth. He always spoke in love. And it was always a conversation, no matter how the conflict went, that he could walk away saying, in that conversation, I glorified my father. He didn't take on the accountability for the other person's response. He took on his accountability for what he is reflecting into the conflict. And he reflected holiness, grace, truth, love. So Paul's going to say, here's some ways to fight. Actually, here's some ways not to fight that can come from the old self that are really going to hinder this, this reconciliation and really just perpetuate the brokenness. In, in, in verse 25, he starts, he goes, therefore... So therefore, since you have the old self is gone, the new self, that's what you're operating out of. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So last week I shared with you that, that, that as a Christ follower, I am the church. She is the church. She is also my neighbor. She's my neighbor I get to sleep with, which is pretty awesome, but you know, I mean, but she's my neighbor. Sorry, we'll edit that out before Sunday. <laughs> but I, I have to realize that, you know, just as Jesus defined who a neighbor is, she is my neighbor. And so we, we are united to one another. And, and I have a responsibility. He says, speak truth. And so what he's saying is don't lie to each other. We, we speak the truth. And when we speak the truth, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit can go to work in the reconciliation. But when we lie to one another, that's where the devil loves to work. Because the devil is a murderer, a thief, and a liar. And he loves to perpetuate lies. He loves to plant lies. He loves to keep it going. And listen, it can be very uncomfortable to be honest with one another. But here's what I've reconciled after, you know, 29 plus marriage. If I can't be honest with her, then I can't be honest with anybody on this planet. And as uncomfortable as that can be, listen, that builds into reconciling. He'll go on in verse 26 and 27 to say this, um, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So what he's saying here is that anger is a natural emotion. We all get angry. I mean, God got angry. See, we're, we're made in the image of God and God has emotions and God, God experiences joy and, and, and you see all of that in the Old Testament. You see where God got angry. He gets angry at sin and God has what's called a righteous anger. And the, the incredible thing about God's anger versus mine is he actually can see the whole situation. Most of the time in my anger, all I'm dealing with is what's right in front of me. I mean, we're dealing with what's in our windshield, Right? And what, what he's saying here is that, that anger is a natural emotion. It's a natural feeling, but there's ways to handle that. He goes, don't, don't sin in that. So what, what, what I learned years ago was, was don't make an emotional decision out of your anger that's going to rob God of his glory. That's the sin. So the way we handle that is let's be angry at the issue and loving towards one another. You know, one of the things you see over and over in God's heart for us, because every one of us deals with sin, every one of us deals with brokenness, that we see God, he's, he is angry at the sin, but he's so loving and kind to us. I mean, I love that God can see that, because anger will put blinders on us, and we begin to see the worst in another person. But God can look at us, even in our worst, and see who we can be. So be angry at the issue, but loving towards one another. We don't want to give the devil a voice in this. Verse 29 goes on. 
uh, he says, I'm sorry, 28, I missed that one. It says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And this one sounds kind of weird. Like, so what do, you, what do you mean stealing in conflict? Most of the conflict in our relationships comes from stealing, but, but there are ways that we can steal from each other in the conflict. I mean, I started just thinking about it. You know, I, the, way we, the way we argue, the way we fight, the way we deal with conflict, you know, I can, I can steal from her. I can steal joy. You know, I can steal peace from her. I can steal time from her because because when we get angry, what we do is we want to we want to lock the other person up, right? And so we're stealing all those emotions and the health from them. You know, I started thinking even down the track of how I can steal from from my wife and my family. And you know, there are times, there are seasons that I've I've allowed myself to fall into just overworking. And when I, when I do that, I'm stealing from her. I'm stealing my time at home and my time with her. So I've got to be very cautious. He, says, he goes, let us do honest work. So let's be honest and not try to take something from somebody. But he says to give as someone has, who has a need. It's how can I continue to give into this relationship? Because it's not about me. It's not about what I get. It's about what God has called me to pour into this relationship. And then he goes on to verse 29, and he says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So he's saying... uh, our responsibility is to build up, and what we say matters. I mean, that thing that we heard growing up, sticks and stones may hurt, break my bones, but words will never harm me, I, that's a lie. Because I, I, I got in some fights when I was growing up, and you know, I don't have the bruises anymore. I walked away with some black eyes. I don't have the black eye anymore, but man, I still carry some scars and wounds in my, in my, my my heart from words, things that were spoken to me that cut so deeply. What we say matters, and words can hurt. When we tear down, it steals grace from others, and ultimately it grieves the Spirit because the Spirit wants to go to work in reconciliation. See, God's heart is a reconciling God, and God wants to see that happen in his kids. And when we are speaking death and we're tearing down instead of building up, the Holy Spirit is grieved. And what do we mean by grieved? It, it, grieving is, 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 is missing something that was alive that is now dying or dead. And we can grieve the Spirit of God who wants to bring life by what we say and what we do. We go on in what we do here. Because in verse 31, he he, he just gets into it now. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. So what are all those things? Because those aren't typical modern day vocabulary. So the the, the bitterness, so you understand that bitterness is, is really fermented unforgiveness. That bitterness is unforgiveness that turns into a poison that ultimately kills the container. So if I hold on to unforgiveness, it becomes bitterness. Then it says it leads to wrath. Wrath is just the outward explosion of the inner feelings. And, and where, where I struggle, and, and I have to, Heather has to help me with this, is, is I'm like the sponge where it'll drip, it'll drip, it'll drip, it'll drip, and it gets full, and then the slightest pressure means, here it goes. That's wrath. That's the pie pie moment, right? I've had all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. And you just go, I mean, you just, I, I heard one woman say, she said, she goes, I just go off like a shotgun, and then it's all over. And her husband said, yeah, but there's all this destruction in the wake of that explosion. <laughs> That's wrath. Um, and then he says, uh, uh, wrath and anger can often lead to clamor and slander. It just means this, clamor's fighting with the fist and slander's fighting with the words, that we can, we can let our bitterness take root in our marriage and in relationships, and it will build up to where wrath is the explosion, and then we're, we're tearing down with words, and then, and then in, in sad cases in marriages, we see this, that it goes physical. And he said, that, that, that's not who we are. There's other ways to handle this. And he said, and then, that, then put away the malice. Malice is the intent to harm the other person where you're actually, now you're so bitter and it's taken so much root that you actually plan on how to harm the other person. 
think about all that steals from us. He goes, this is not the way we're called to fight. These result from hard hearts, darkened thinking, and alienation from God. He says, but but you learned Christ, you know Christ. Those who know Christ are sealed with the Holy Spirit, constantly reminding us whose we are, and we have a new identity, we have a new way to process this, and that can allow grace and forgiveness to go to work. And here's, here's, here's the cure in verse 32. He says this, he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That tender heart comes from the grace of God. The grace of God just melts this heart of stone and, 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 and brings in this beautiful grace. I receive forgiveness from God, then I can forgive others. And, and, and reconciliation can happen after forgiveness. So reconciliation is a process that starts with forgiveness. The only way we get back to good, I mean, I hear this so often, I want to get back to good. Well, if we're in this situation, was that good? I mean, how about we go on to better? But it starts with forgiveness. And from God to me, then me to others. Let me me read you a story that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 18 about forgiveness. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, a great amount of money. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have mercy, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him. He said, patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt. Because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother in your heart. I mean, think, this is the scene. You've, you've got a man who owes his, 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 his employer, we'll say. He, he owes him thousands and thousands of dollars. And then you've got another guy that owes him pennies on the dollar. He gets forgiven this great debt, but yet goes out and puts this other guy on the chokehold to say, you're going to pay me. And then he says, nope, you're going to prison until you can pay it. Here's the crazy thing. In prison, he can't pay it. So it's just stopped everything. Heather and I I were in Mexico uh, in 2020, early 2020. And we were down there doing some missions uh, explorations. And we were driving in an SUV. And, and, and we get on the road, and all of a sudden, we get just hit, plowed from the back by a dump truck. And so we're there on the side of the road, and, and so they're calling ambulances. And because since we're, we were U.S. citizens, they have their protocols where we had to go to the hospital. Um, but what was interesting is while we're there on the side of the road, the, the dump truck driver and his wife were standing over to the side, and she was, she was unconsolable. I mean, she was heaving. She was sick on the side of the road, just crying and sobbing uncontrollably. And I kept asking, check her. Is she all right? And what, what we found out, the reason she was sobbing is, it, is the law was if you cause an accident and don't have insurance, you go to jail until it's paid. And she knew her husband was going to be arrested in just a few minutes. And we think about that. Why do we keep imprisoning the people we love so much? Because of things we're holding on to. And when, when Jesus tells this story, he's saying the grace and the forgiveness that you have received, you could never pay that back. You were in prison and bondage and 
and dead in your sin. You, you, weren't even a, you, you don't even have life in you to be able to pay God back for all of our wrong. But yet, since God is so great in his mercy and love for us, that he gave his son for us, that he got us out of prison, and he covered our debts, and he goes, that's what I expect you to do. This new self, this new identity that you have in Christ is to now operate in that. And he says, freely you have been forgiven. You need to forgive freely. And listen, forgiveness, forgiveness kills bitterness. But forgiveness should be immediate and complete. So when, when I'm wronged, when Heather and I get into conflict, I have to immediately and completely forgive her. That means I'm releasing her of holding it over her head, but I'm also releasing myself so bitterness doesn't take a root in my life. So the forgiveness really is for me, but then it starts a process of reconciliation. And just as forgiveness is immediate and complete, reconciliation is limited and progressive. And this is, this is a tough one to, to, to really communicate because some of you have had some deep wounds and hurts in your marriage. And, and, and forgiveness is, is what needs to be settled with you and then forgiving the other person. And then reconciliation, see, doesn't mean that you just open up the gates and allow it to happen again. Reconciliation means that you now have to go to work on a different battle plan. How do we build trust and how do we reevaluate those boundaries? And as that trust is built, we move those boundaries so that the Holy Spirit can lead us in this process of reconciling to one another. And ultimately, it starts with reconciling to him. So every relationship has brokenness because people are broken. But listen, that should not become our excuse. We can't just walk around going, well, I'm broken, so that's who I am and that's what I do. No, 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 no. There is grace available to change us so we don't have to stay broken. We enter into a process of allowing God to address the brokenness and change us, and then we move it out. And forgiveness, listen, the way we get forgiveness from God is through prayer. And one of Heather and I's strategies, our tactics in our conflict, is I praise, she prays. Then we come together and we pray. Last week I gave you a challenge. I said, serve your wife, serve your husband for 30 days with no expectation of anything in return. Serve, because we have been served by God. I want to add another one. I want you to pray together. If you struggle with what to say in that prayer, then just open up to Ephesians chapter 5 and just read Ephesians chapter 5, start in verse 22 and read through the end of the chapter. And it might be, husbands, it might be holding your wife's hand and reading that and saying, Lord, help me to be this husband. Wives, it might be reading that to your husband and saying, Lord, help me to be this wife. It's got to start somewhere. Matter of fact, it's gonna, we'll start now. So here's what I want you to do. If you're, if, you are, if you're married, I want you to grab hands. If you're single, then I want you to start praying for the grace to be at work in you and pray for who God has for you. If you're in conflict with any relation, I'm not, this ain't just marriage. We all have conflict in relationships then I want you to start saying, search my heart. But if you're, if you're in here and you are married, then I want you to pray with each other to where they can hear you. You don't have to shout it out. I'm not asking for anything like that. I'm just saying, whisper in their ear. Just pray. So I'm going to give you just a, a moment to do that. And then I'll come back and then I'll close this out.
Jesus, you entered into our brokenness to reconcile us. And I'm asking you to forgive us. Jesus, forgive me. I pray that it's all our prayer to say, Jesus, forgive me for putting the old self back on. Or Jesus, I need you to forgive me for the first time in my life for that new identity in you. Forgive me for tearing down and not building up. And I ask you to help us forgive as we have been forgiven. God, I'm asking you to resurrect dead marriages. And I'm asking you to reconcile us together as you make a beautiful masterpiece from broken pieces. It's for your glory and your name we pray. Amen. Love you. Hey, thank you for tuning in and worshiping with us today. Our mission here at the Creek is to see lives changed by the message of Jesus Christ. And we're so glad that you're here to be a part of it today with us. If this is your first time to tune in to our online service, we want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And one of the best ways that you, you can engage with us is through our online connect card. By scanning the QR code on your screen, you can let us know that this is your first time. This is also a great way to let us know how we can be praying for you. Whether online or in person, our prayer team is ready to pray over any request that you may have. Our hope for you today is that God moved on your heart in a mighty way and that you encountered him and his presence during this time. Now, if you're looking to get plugged into the creek, we would love to invite you to join us on campus or one of our many ways to connect online. For weekly blogs, serving opportunities, or virtual Bible studies, check out our website. Man, we love you guys and hope you have a great day.